Good evening, everyone. Let me know if you have any trouble hearing me at any point. I'm going to do a better job of talking into the microphone. So, um, first of all, I want to welcome all of you and thank you for coming to the Historical Worlds Collection uh, for our event tonight with Emily Reese and the Preservation Hall All Stars. We have a really wonderful program that I'm really looking forward to, and I'm thrilled to be partnering with our friends and neighbors, Emily Reese uh, and Preservation Hall. I'd like to give a special thank you to Emily for joining us tonight and to the Pre Preservation Hall Foundation and the Preservation Hall All Stars. So thank, thank both of you very much. Thank you. But before we start tonight's program, I want to take a brief moment to introduce myself and mention our current exhibitions and our upcoming programming. My name is Eric Seifert, and I'm a curator and historian at the Historic Worlds Collection. And I had the pleasure of working on the exhibition Giants of Jazz, which is currently on display in our Williams Gallery through the end of December, so it closes on the 30th of this month. At the Williams Research Center over on Charter Street, we have Storyville, Madams and Music, uh, which I also worked on alongside Pamela Arsenault, our senior librarian and her books curator and author of the recently published um, Guidebooks to Sin, the Blue Books of Storyville, New Orleans, and uh, director of museum programs, John Morris. This show will be up through December 2nd. In our Laura Simon Nelson galleries, we have on display a most significant gift, the Laura Simon Nelson collection, which is up through this Saturday. So I urge you, if you want to check that out, uh, now is the time to do so. On Wednesday, November 15th, we'll be screening the silent version of The Hunchback of Notre Dame with live piano accompaniment from pianist Karol Moskowski. And on Friday, November 17th, we'll have our last concert in the courtyard of the season with Javier Orlando and Asha Sun. Uh, you can get more information about all the exhibits um, and the upcoming programs on our website, which is hnfc.org. So like many of you, um, I was uh, saddened last week to hear of the passing of Taz Domino. It goes without saying that his contributions to New Orleans music, American music, rhythm and blues, and rock and roll were singular. My colleagues and I would like to take a moment to acknowledge Fats and celebrate his memory tonight on the night of his memorial second line. All right. Well, without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and introduce tonight's program. The exhibition Giants of Jazz, which we open for viewing following this discussion portion of tonight's program, includes another number of poster portraits by the Polish artist Waldemar Szczerza, um, the majority of which are prominent jazz musicians. Although also included in the show is a poster for the 30th Annual International Jazz Festival, which was in Warsaw in 1988. So New Orleans has its own tradition of music posters and of music and musicians as subjects or themes within the visual arts. Tonight, we plan to highlight and discuss these traditions, and to help us do this, we've asked the very talented Emily Reese to join us. Since returning to New Orleans in 2011, Emily has developed a unique style of pen and ink drawings depicting live musical performances. She is currently celebrating the one-year anniversary of her gallery space, Scenes by Reese Art Gallery, at the courtyard entrance of 708 Toulouse, just right around the corner. Though largely self-taught, Emily hails from a family of artists including her paternal grandparents, Floyd Davis, and Gladys Rockmore Davis, and her father, Noel Rockmore. Tonight she'll be talking about her work, her father's work, her grandparents, and of course, Waldemar Sperja as well, as we explore the confluence of the musical and visual arts. So Emily, uh, we're so happy to have you here tonight. Uh, I want to ask everyone to please help me in giving a warm welcome to Emily Reese. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Yes, indeed. Um. All right, so we're going to um, kind of pass the microphone back and forth a little bit. I may just project at some points. So like I said, if you can't hear, let us know. But I want to first start just by giving a quick introduction to, to Schwerja. I think many of you may have already seen um, some of his posters, which are on display just across the courtyard. Um, we've got a selection of them here, but I, uh, I 
will give you just a quick introduction into him. Um, he's a Polish artist and part of the Polish, or was a Polish artist, and part of the, the Polish poster school, um, which really hit, hit its peak in the 60s, started around the 1950s into the 60s, um, and by the 70s was kind of on the decline. Um, the, the school focused on, on really all kinds of different posters. So they did theater posters, posters for movies, um, PSAs, all kinds of things. And they incorporated a lot of um, graphic design elements, a lot of um, surrealism into their work. In the 70s, Sergio, um moves towards the portrait, which is kind of what we're here to talk about today. And, and he does around 400 some portraits, including some self-portraits. And he really focuses a lot on um, Western figures of, of um, popular culture. So if you've been through the exhibition, you'll notice it's all uh, jazz musicians with the exception of Jimi Hendrix um, and, and some studies for a portrait of Martin Luther King <coughs> Jr. Um, so that's a little bit about Sherja. Um, and I'm gonna pass the mic to Emily, let her go into these posters a little bit more and talk about some of the artistic elements um, in them and some of uh, the relationship between his work and, and her work. So. Thank you very much. I'm gonna put this back to where we can see, hopefully, see the pictures again. Uh, I think this might do it. Yeah. Yes, because the very first one, King Oliver, looked so familiar to me when I came to the show a few months ago, and I suddenly realized it's at Fritzl's. It is over the fireplace at Fritzl's, and it is in one of my drawings from 2013. But at the time that I drew the King Oliver poster, I didn't know Schwerja. I didn't know anything about it. I just thought, what a cool thing, the smoke coming from the, from the trumpet. So I chose these five pictures because I felt that they expressed the range of um, the manner in which he speaks about how musicians can be depicted and how can he tell us something about that specific musician. So the Coltrane one, for instance, I, I just think that's incredible. It, I see it as a totem of intensity. And if that isn't Coltrane, I don't know what is. Um, and West Montgomery, it, it's just this gorgeous bit of filigree full of color where the sound is coming out of the guitar. Uh, Ella is just looking so solid and elegant. Lewis is looking like a prize fighter, which musically he really was. He was the, the king of the prize fight. And then, and then King Oliver, fundamental, the origin story you know, of jazz. So that's why I chose these five. And uh, I think we're ready to move on now. So next, I wanted to bring in my grandparents, along with my father and myself. Um, my grandfather that I know of, Floyd Davis, I don't think he ever did any pictures with musicians, but he did do some pictures that had to do with performance. And we'll see one coming up soon. So we have here Bob Hope entertaining the troops. And I think I probably put that on a little fast. Do you mind if I go back and bring it by again? Let me see if it will come up the way it was supposed to. You think it might come up on its own? Sorry, let's see this again. See if it pops up more slowly, the, the images. So for those of you who don't know, these are Noel Rockmore's parents, and they were both artists their whole lives. So Eric, you think it will come up? I think it's gonna come. There we go. Um, there well, we go. One of the things that I think is really interesting about um, Emily's grandparents and, and her dad is this, there is this direct lineage of art depicting um, depicting musical performances. Here we have Bob Hope, who's obviously not uh, 
performing music, but is, is performing in a minute. We'll see a little bit more from her grandmother. Yes. Um, um, and I think that style of showing um, performance comes all the way through. Mm -hmm. So my dad's mother, Gladys, she studied at the Chicago Art Institute, graduated, I think, in 1925, and went on to have a thriving career in New York. Uh, here we have a portrait of her son, her daughter on the left. And she wasn't known per se for um, doing pictures of musicians, but these were among some of her more popular paintings. So Emily, can you tell us a little bit about um, Noel's relationship with music and um, your grandparents' relationship with music? You told me when we were talking before that he, as a child, was actually more of a musician than and a visual yes. artist. This is true, uh, and that's why you see him in the two paintings with instruments. He was a violinist as a child, and he was quite good. Um, his sister also was a musician, a pianist, and they used to give recitals in, in the apartment in New York. Uh, and all his life he played music. He played the violin, he played piano. Uh, it was something that was a part of his life throughout his existence. Now, I have to say something about Clara Rockmore. She was, um, she was a violinist also, uh, who at the age of 18 suffered tendinitis in her bowing arm and had to give up the violin. And just at that moment in New York, she met Leon Theremin. Now, Leon Theremin invented the instrument, the theremin, and you do not touch anything while you're playing. My grandmother did this painting um, of Clara, who was her first cousin's wife. And uh, I think it's incredible the way she captures that sense of um, playing an instrument without touching it. And Eric had pointed out earlier that he saw in this a relationship to the Schwerzas, the use of negative space, and just the strong graphic content in this image. I think if anyone has seen uh, Clara Rockmore play the Dermot, and you can watch her do this on YouTube, uh, the, the videos are pretty extraordinary. It's immediately um, evident this pose, and it's very familiar from, from that playing style. And the theremin, for those of you unfamiliar, you play by moving your two hands. So one hand, um, you're basically sending an electrical signal through your body. One hand adjusts the pitch and the other mm -hmm. adjusts the volume. So you can see her hands here. She's really, Gladys in her portrayal of, of Clara is really evoking that with her hands. And of course, you, the, the whole movement of your body changes the pitch. Her face, her stare while she's playing uh, the instrument is very kind of staid and static. And, 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 I mean, and it has to be because she told me, I, I was good friends with Clara in her, uh, later in her life in New York. Uh, she told me that uh, you had to keep your whole body immobilized and really only move your fingers most of the time. So it really was a very static pose, but out of that she created the most gorgeous music. Uh, there is a documentary called, I think it's called The, S the Strange Odyssey of Leon Theremin, and it, it depicts the, the, the re reunion of Clara and Theremin in 1990, I think it was. And I had a small role in behind the scenes in getting things ready for the professor on, upon his return to New York at the age of 90. So in any case, that's, that's a interesting sideline there. And then I wanted to end this little segment with this photograph of my family all working in Gladys's studio together. And that's my father on the floor, his sister to his right, and then my grandparents. And I think be before you jump, I think it's really interesting to see this photo. Um, and you see Noel, he's playing his violin earlier. He's obviously musically inclined. The family is obviously musically inclined. 
here you see his visual art world, and you see how he is growing up in this environment at his mother's studio in New York City. Um, fat flash forward, however many years, um, and the next, the next line in this in this family, Emily isn't a part of this, but she comes through her own path and becomes uh, and, and joins kind of the artistic family. I think it's really interesting to see how that happens um, very differently than than with Noel. So we have a little segue before we get to Preservation Hall and my dad and me in New Orleans. And the segue has to do with a photographer, Elliot Elisafan. The only reason that I found his name and the reason we're looking at this photograph is that I was given a photograph when I was 30. It was a Life Magazine photograph. It was an original. It had a very large Life Magazine stamp on the back. And it was the only photograph my siblings and I had ever seen of our family, father and mother and three kids, together. Because when I was a baby, my father left the family, came down to New Orleans, and I didn't see him again until I was 20. We had no record of anything, the art, the family as a unit. Well, <coughs> Elliot Elisafan, as it says here, was a really right, quite remarkable photographer. And in 1951, he accompanied the team that made the African Queen, John Houston, and all the actors to Africa. And he had published in Life magazine a bunch of those photographs, but quite a few were not published. So Time Life in 2013 published a group of them. And I said, my God, how marvelous. In 51, he's in Africa with Bogey and Bacall and Hepburn. And then in 1956, he is sent to photograph one Noel Davis, a 27-year-old artist. So this is the photograph I was given when I was 30. And you can imagine what I felt seeing for the first time. My God, we were once a family. <laughs> so in working on this project, uh, I decided to dig deeper with the internet now. We can find things that heretofore were impossible to find. And I located someone who could send to me pictures of all of the rolls of film, of this, the contact sheets. So my siblings and I are now looking at contact sheets of all the photographs taken that day. Many of them showing our parents in natural poses that are just so lovely. It's, it's like a miracle, like suddenly we have a larger notion of the family that we once were. And then from that photo shoot, this was the, the feature that ran. And only one of the photographs from it made it into the um, article in Life magazine. And all these years I never knew <laughs> Was that photograph taken by the man who took the photograph of us? Well, with the contact sheets, yes, he was the same photographer. It was just marvelous to find this out a few weeks ago. I don't know, is it not doing a fade? Okay. So first here we have some early pen and ink works, things that I did when I was 14 or age 20. The two cemetery scenes were done here in St. Louis Cemetery number one. Can, Emily, can you give us a little bit of a timeline of, um, of you growing as, a, as an artist out, out west and, and your dad coming to New Orleans and back to New York and when, when you're doing these two drawings, you're in New Orleans with your dad. So. Yes, having just met him um, a few months previously, um, met him in uh, the fall of 
76, and he said, why don't you go down to New Orleans? I'll be there in a few, in a, in a few weeks. And so I did. I, I came in early 77. And uh, these are some of the first things that I did. And uh, in terms of growing up as an artist, it's, it, it was interesting what you said about that large photograph showing my dad's family all working together in an art studio. I didn't have that. Uh, my mother was not encouraging at all. She didn't want my brother or me to be artists, and we both did become artists anyhow. <laughs> it is something that comes through the genes. You can't, you can't stop that. <laughs> and for instance, when I showed her that drawing I, I created at age 14, she just simply said, you didn't do that. 